I know. He looks a little older, a little grayer, and a little ha uh, hairier. <laughs> <laughs> And for those of you who know me, it's because of a fishing trip, right? And uh, so uh, the hair will come off eventually, uh, but uh, at this point, uh, I was traveling a lot. And to get here, I know I'm a little disheveled, but what a blessing to be here on such a night and to celebrate what the Lord has done and how this church is in more evidence of that flow of the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the passage I chose is actually the one that we sent Stephen and Courtney out on from Grace Church. So the very Sunday that we prayed for them and sent them out, uh, this was the message that we sent them out with. And I want to read to you again from the book of Acts, chapter 13. And we'll just start with verses 1 to 5. You have to just imagine how the apostles must have cheered when the risen Lord appeared to them and said, after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And those who had just believed they had seen their Savior crucified and the movement done are being assured that they are going to be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And they must wow, that's great. And then somebody must have thought, now how are we going to do that? <laughs> Maybe the way a church starts in the beginning or right in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> Maybe when a presbytery that hasn't been accustomed for starting churches for a while. Maybe when we're discouraged about what the Lord may be doing in region and place. We think, now, now how are you going to do that? Uh, this way. Acts 13, now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Let's pray together. Father, it's your word, blessed by your spirit in being given and your spirit still works that we would receive it. Not only receive it, but obey it. Because we have been inspired by it, strengthened by it, ultimately compelled by it to do your will. We ask that you would so equip us by your spirit now. In Jesus' name, amen. I know it seems a long way away, but let me just remind you that on this particular Sunday... More people will worship Jesus in China than in the United States. A much smaller proportion of the population, but such a large population that I will say it again, more people will worship Jesus in China than in the United States. More people will worship Jesus in Africa than in the United States. Beginning of the last century, only a bare fraction of a percent of those would have identified themselves as Christians on the continent of Africa. Today, over half the continent identifies as Christian. That's over 500 million people identifying as Christian. That is more than all the people of the United States. Where is the fastest growing church in the world? Iran. Persecuted, pressed, underground, and flourishing. If you are under age 15, you must know this. More Muslims have come to Christ in your lifetime than in the last 15 centuries. I mention all those facts to you just to say this. 
Francis Chan is right when he says, we do no greater damage to the work of the Holy Spirit than when we look at the New Testament and we say, that was just ancient hyperbole. God doesn't work that way anymore. His Spirit is not. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. He can start a church in COVID. (laughs) He can bring people to himself out of a secular culture. He can work beyond our strength and our ability because he's not dependent just on our ability, our numbers, our strength, but on our dependence on the work of the Holy Spirit. We say it so readily and so easily. What is our task as believers if we want to be used by the Lord? It's to get in step with the Spirit. But how do you do that? I mean, we want to lift our sails to the Spirit and say, blow, Spirit. Take us where you want us to go. But what does that actually mean? And we gain some understanding of it when we look here at the book of Acts, roughly midway through, in observing the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we all know the Holy Spirit has been blowing hard prior to this chapter. Early portions of the book of Acts. You know what happened. The Holy Spirit begins to blow. And 3,000 people in one day... Come to faith. And that wasn't the end of the work because the Lord began to add daily to that church such as believed. But that really was the problem because some of the Jewish priests in Jerusalem actually began to believe in Jesus Christ. And that's when the higher authorities had enough of that. And so they began to organize ways to crush the church and particularly higher a young man with a promising future named Saul to persecute the church. And he did a very effective job. So effective that the Christians were largely driven out of Jerusalem. And they, they went so far that if you were just observing from human measure, you would say, well, the Jews in the authority succeeded in crushing the church. But some of those Christians who were driven out of Jerusalem became like seeds on the wind. And some of them landed in that ancient land bridge between Africa and the Middle East and Asia that we call Asia Minor. And at a town called Antioch, they started a church. Nobody there before. Nothing really to start with. But that is the place where they were first named what? Christians at Antioch. And not only were they named Christians, they began to do what Christians do. They worship God. And they sent out those who would start new churches and establish a greater work by the power of the Holy Spirit. We learn something of what that Spirit requires of those who will be used by Him In the beginning of this chapter, the church is now established. And we have what is, in essence, the roster of the leaders of the church at Antioch. At first, there are a few surprises. There were in the church at Antioch, verse 1, prophets and teachers, Barnabas. Well, there's a good Jewish name, Barnabas. You you actually know. We've only been in seminary a week or two. That uh, Barnabas' name actually means son of encouragement. And we think, what a wonderful guy. (laughs) Don't you wish you were named Barnabas? Don't you wish you had the personality of Barnabas? And here on the first missionary journey, Barnabas goes with Paul to support him and encourage him. But one of the things that you have to recognize, the work of the Spirit, was where they went. In verse 4, they sailed to Cyprus. Why is that important? Because even though Barnabas is a Jew with a Jewish name, his home was Cyprus. He was raised on a Greek island in Greek culture. Why is it so important that Barnabas goes with Paul? Paul is a missionary to where? To the Greeks. And in God's planning, a generation before, he has planted Barnabas to be raised in Greek culture so that when Paul is going to be a missionary to the Greeks, he takes Barnabas with him to teach him. What a wonderful story. 
except it's got some harsh overtones. You may remember after the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas decide to go again on a second missionary journey. But Barnabas doesn't join this time. Do you remember why? The reason is because of what it says at the end of verse 5. On this first trip, they had John to assist them. Now, depending on what translation you have, John is either a nephew or a cousin of Barnabas. And uh, on that missionary journey, when they go to Cyprus, John, also called John Mark, recognize where they are going to go. They are going to go to the hometown. You know, if you have to minister to somebody, if you have to share the gospel with somebody, who do you most hate telling the gospel to? Your family and friends. They remember you in high school, you know. They know all your weaknesses, all your foibles, all your frailties. And John Mark says, if we're going to Cyprus, I am not. And he abandons the missionary journey. So that when Barnabas and Paul get ready for the second journey, Barnabas says, Let, let's take John Mark again. And what does Paul say? No way. He abandoned us. That is the coward of Cyprus, and he's not going, and it became a falling out between Paul and Barnabas that lasted for years until it was patched over. And you think, well, that, that's kind of a sad story. Until you recognize the gospel on display. That nephew was named John Mark. Do you recognize that every time you open your Bible to the opening gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the second gospel is the gospel of the coward of Cyprus. The one who is redeemed, restored, used by, it's the great expression of the gospel that God is able to work past our weakness, past our sin, past our cowardice. What he is doing in his church is he is using fallible, fallen, weak creatures who nonetheless are dependent on him and even someone like John Mark becomes used by God to tell the gospel for centuries to millions across all continents, not because of his ability, because of the grace of God and the power of the Spirit. That's just the first name on the list, Barnabas. There is another name that's demonstrating the gospel in wonderful tones. The second name on the list, Simeon or Simon, who is called Niger. Niger just means black. Simon called the black, undoubtedly a reference to his skin color. We still recognize the name and its origin, Nigeria. Niger, if you think of where the news is these days, where those who are black skin. But we don't expect a name like Simon, a Jewish name, to be someone with black skin. How could that be? Because if you were Jewish... And you had black skin, that would mean somewhere in your heritage there is intermarriage. You are not a pure Jew. You would be scorned. Why is Simon, called the black, mentioned in the leadership? Well, again, in God's wonderful plan and timing centuries and centuries before, there had been a king who followed King David named Asa. And Asa, trying to extend the boundaries of the kingdom of Israel, took his armies all the way down into North Africa. And even by the time of Jesus, there was still a colony of Jews in North Africa in a region that we call Cyrene. Here is Simon the Black. Simon of <laughs> Cyrene. Does that ring a bell? The great pastor, theologian John Stott said, this can be none other than Simon of Cyrene, who's in the leadership of the church at Antioch. Why is that important? Do you remember? As Jesus is carrying his cross, having been scourged with loss of blood, not able to bear the load, he falls and when he falls, a Roman soldier just grabs a man out of, the cross, out of the crowd and says, you carry the cross. And the name of the man 
who carried the cross of Jesus to Golgotha, the name of that man was Simon of Cyrene. And here he is in leadership of the church at Ant. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for those in the church to read? He carried the instrument of the torture and the death of our Lord. He doesn't deserve any place. He shouldn't be. And he's in leadership. Redeemed. Restored. Cleansed. Now used as the church is built to send the gospel out to the nations. Next on the list, look, Lucius of Cyrene. Now for the first time, not not a Jewish name, but a Roman name. The name of the oppressors. The ones whose military power supported the Jews who drove the Christians out of Jerusalem. Now we have a Roman, a, a, a member of the nation that is persecuting these very people. But where's he from? He's from Cyrene too. And suddenly all the sense of, of chills you begin to understand. In the very first place where there was a church named Christian, there was this cadre of African believers who were actually in the leadership. After all, what had Jesus said? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and, so, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And now in this land bridge between Africa and the Middle East and Asia, you're beginning to have all the representatives in the church. From the Middle East, from Europe, from Africa, and there is more. After Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Now, you can't be around Christian circles very long before getting confused about the Herods. There, there are so many of them, you know. And wh which Herod is this? His father is the one we're about to tell stories about, again, at Christmas time. Because the father is the one to whom the wise men came. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And the father of this Herod said, well, go find him. Tell me where he is that I may come and worship him. Which, of course, was not the real motive. The motive was to exterminate all possible rivals. And when the wise men, being warned by an angel, went home another way, what did this Herod's father do? He killed all the babes of Bethlehem. That's the heritage of this Herod. But he has blood on his hands, too. After all, it was this Herod who married his brother's wife. And as a consequence, he comes under the preaching of John the Baptist, who condemns him. And this Herod, upset about that, arrested John the Baptist so he could not preach anymore. And one night, you remember, when the daughter of this Herod danced erotically before him, he made a promise in his ecstasy, ask whatever you want, even up to half my kingdom, and I'll give it to you. And what did the daughter ask for? The head of John the Baptist. And he gave it to her. He also killed James, the brother of John. He also imprisoned Peter, this Herod. But worst of all, it was this Herod that turned Jesus over to Pilate. And now in the church at Antioch, in the leadership, is Manaean, a lifelong friend of this Herod. Listen, if there's any human truth that we know, it is uh, the friend of my enemy is my enemy. Manaean, who's been raised in the court, who's a friend of Herod. The very one who turned Jesus over to Pilate. Manaean is in the church. You can just feel almost viscerally what people must have felt. Lord, you, you can ask me to have some respect for the coward of Cyprus. You, you, you can even make me, you can help me, but you can make me love and respect a man, 
of different colored skin or even an oppressor nation. But Menaean, Lord, that is a bridge too far. I can't accept it. I can't. I can't. But if that is the work of the Spirit, working past our boundaries and bigotries and antipathies, you begin to understand that part of the work of the church is to bow before the Spirit in ways the world cannot understand. That we actually begin to say, despite what has been done, despite our past, despite our difficulties, despite our antipathies, we will be known by the love that we have for one another and the respect that we give to one another. And the Holy Spirit will be on display in the way that we treat one another in the church. And if you think that you can actually do that in your own strength, you have yet to read the last name on the list. What name is that? After Manaean, it just comes so quickly. And who? Saul. Do you recognize the very reason these people are in Antioch? They have lost their homes. Paul, by his own testimony, has pursued some of their relatives to torture and death. They, they have no livelihood in this new place. They, they are not in their own home, their own nation. They are driven away. They've lost everything. And they're in the church. And one of the leaders is the very man who led the persecution. I mean, just imagine if you were a Ukrainian Christian this day and, and you've seen the bombs destroy your home and you've lost family and you've lost your home and you've had to go to another nation and here you are in the United States and you, you walk into a church and in that church you, you walk in until one of the leaders who stands up is a former Russian general. Would you stay? Could you worship? Or would you turn on your heel and walk away? What does it mean truly to lift your sails to the Spirit and say, Spirit, you blow where you want me to go. You take my heart where you want me to go. I think of those of you who are being installed as elders and a pastor in this church. And there is such joy in a moment and such joy in a night and such recognition of the wonder that God has done to bring people together in a in a city that we know has so much secular influence in a place where the plowing has been so hard through COVID to still establish something with godly people and a godly pastor and the, the joy of the moment. But this we know, there happen to be sinners who will gather in this church and there happen to be sinners who will lead this church. And the ability to say, for the sake of the testimony of the Holy Spirit, we will love past boundaries and bigotries and antipathies that the Spirit may be known. Paul, when he writes to the Christians at Ephesus, a multinational church, says to this, that in the church, the manifold wisdom of God is on display to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realms. In the church, the manifold wisdom of God is on display to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realm. That word manifold in the Greek New Testament is the same word that the Greek translators used to translate Joseph's multicolored coat. In the church, the multicolored wisdom of God is on display so that even the angels and the demons look at us gathered together and say, my, what a God. If he can get those people together, this must truly be a powerful work. And that's supposed to be what the church is. This is, this is not political correctness. This is not critical race theory. This is not being woke. This is the gospel in power among the people that God is drawing to himself. Where he is saying, I will bring my spirit so that people who would normally hate each other and be divided and would be angry with one another and could not forgive one another will come together as a display of what the gospel does so that they begin to yearn in the community for such a church and such a people. I, 
I praise God, and you've heard me say this in different places I trust. Our years at Grace were our most beautiful years of ministry. And there was no question that the reason that we felt that was the case was the support that we had of the leaders, the session, and the deacons of that church. Honestly, they would just confess. They'd had some years of fight, and they were just tired of fighting, and they tired of the difficult. And so we, we prayed together, and, and we talked about our differences. And we just, here's some things we're going to do. We're not going to vote on any proposal the first time that it comes to a meeting. Why? No surprises, no power plays. We're brothers. And it may take a little longer to get things done, but we're going to trust one another. We're going to give people the opportunity to think about it and work through. And, 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 and we have differences. And we're going to talk about them. We're going to be honest about them. And then we're going to love one another. You know, there may be more reconciliation that happened during the bathroom breaks than during the meetings themselves. You know, yeah, I'm so sorry what I said. I'm sorry, I'm sorry too. And, and, and then we come back and we work together. It is not easy. It is necessary for the work of God to go forward. But it will not happen in your own strength. What actually brings the Spirit to bear? Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me. Barnabas and Saul. There's one thing. They're worshiping together. How can the Spirit demonstrate the love of believers if we don't come together? You know, we're all streaming these days. And, and there can be wonderful benefits for people who can't come. But we all know how pleasant it is some mornings just to stay in your pajamas with a cup of coffee. <laughs> but how is that a witness? to the? I know it's good for you. How is that a witness to the community? These people have lost homes. They have lost family members. And still they come together and they say, our hope is in the eternal. There's still reason to worship. And they come together to worship. And they fast. And they pray. Why, why do you pray? You pray because you are confessing something. God, we need you. We, we can't do this by ourselves. We need you. And even though we don't always think about it, fasting is just the physical expression of that prayer. I, we, we don't always remember that. I was, I was raised in a tradition where all Christians prayed, but it was the really holy ones that fasted, you know. And, and you know, and we all know, we were told, you know, why do you fast? Well, you fast so that you can just concentrate on the Lord. And I knew that was Supposed to be true, but my trouble was whenever I fasted, I could only concentrate on McDonald's. You know, it's kind of like, and I felt guilty and I felt wrong. But what if I recognized that my hunger was worship? That what that emptiness is saying is not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When I'm emptying myself of nutrients and strength, I, it's not in my strength that I'll be able to. It's that confession to God, the same as prayer. I need you. And as you leaders and people and pastor come, it's, it's great that you would gather. You must gather for the witness that is required. But the gathering is worship and it is prayer and is denial of self for the sake of the gospel. There's a beauty in that and a necessity in it. Uh, as I see faces across the room, I simply want to acknowledge that there were willing people to deny themselves and what might seem best for their own church. The Presbytery itself, you know, just supporting yet another work. It's not, it's not a rich Presbytery. There's not a lot of prosperous churches. And there was a convicting that if the Lord is really at work, then Jerusalem becomes Judea, becomes Samaria, becomes the uttermost parts. That we call others to obedience to Christ. We call and make other churches. That that's what's always the calling of God's people. We're not just about ourselves. And Grace Church, as the leadership began to say, we should be doing this. We haven't done it for a while. And no one more effective, I'll embarrass him, than Pastor Greg Greninger, who convinced us all 
it could happen and organized it so it could happen and kept pressing so that it would happen. And I praise God for people who are saying, listen, we, we could keep feathering our nest, but our calling is Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts. And the blessing happens when you see people who give themselves to that effort. And Stephen gave himself to that effort. And Courtney, they had opportunities. And there were times that I thought, this is a huge risk for this young family. But they wanted to do it for Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ministry to another town and to start something new and to be a part of what God would do by his spirit. And then it became harder than anyone expected because of COVID, because of the difficulties of getting things going, because the presbytery itself and all the churches were going through COVID and all the strains and difficulties too. And, and then it happened. And maybe that's the blessing. Because by all human reckoning, it shouldn't have happened. Shouldn't have been possible. So who gets the credit? Well, Stephen, no, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. And we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for those that you sent among us. Thank you for those who continue to inspire us. Because we will continue to need them. It's when we believe that the Holy Spirit is at work that the obstacles become opportunities. The difficulties, doorways. Because we're saying, Lord, I can't do this. We can't do this. But we believe your spirit is calling us to work beyond ourselves and actually to depend upon him. Can it be effective? Sometimes just the testimonies of what happens in your own life, you have trouble believing when you see the spirit do it. Also during COVID, uh, I was asked to be the speaker at what is known as the Hong Kong Bible Conference. Hong Kong Bible Conference there in communist China, uh, still under British influence at that time, um, draws a quarter million people a year to worship the Lord. But COVID shut it down. And uh, I got this letter while at Grace Church, Dr. Chapel. As you know, the COVID virus is widespreading in China, causing tens of thousands to go under treatment. In Hong Kong, public activities are suspended, schools closed, church meetings suspended. As the scheduled speaker of this Hong Kong Bible Conference, we would like to invite you to write a short message to encourage the saints here so that we would be comforted and inspired. Now, I must tell you, I thought, who am I to write to you to inspire you? Uh, my ministry does not require persecution. My ministry does not require great difficulty. I'm rewarded for my ministry. Who am I to tell you of inspiration that should allow you to continue under persecution and hurt and COVID in ways that would honor God? I, I didn't know what to say. I could only write the words of Scripture. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as I read the challenges you now face in China, I write to tell you the eyes of the world are upon you. The eyes of the angels are upon you. Most of all, the eyes of King Jesus are upon you. Even when we don't know how to pray for you, the Holy Spirit intercedes for you with groanings too deep to utter, according to the will of God, so that all things will work together for good. For this I know, these temporary afflictions are working for you a far more eternal weight of glory for such a time as this you have been called for we know brothers and sisters loved by God that for this time he has called you do you mind my saying I write the words and still wonder what could they mean well about three months ago I was asked post-covid to go back and be the speaker at the Hong Kong Bible Conference it was post-covid Prior, as I said, they'd been drawing a quarter million people, and no one knew what was going to happen. After all the deprivations and all the difficulty and the growing communist incursion upon Hong Kong, the number of people who came to the Hong Kong Bible Conference was only 1.1 million people. It's because I'm such a great speaker. They have no clue who I am. Who did that work? The Holy Spirit. 
as people of God, knelt before the purposes of God and said, despite persecution and difficulty and COVID, the church will prosper as God intends. God did the work as God's people leaned upon him. What is our calling? It is but to believe the Holy Spirit is alive and well. We gather under his mantle because we profoundly believe that when it is our beyond our strength, when we depend upon him, our obstacles are his opportunities. Our difficulties are his doorways. So we call each other leaders, pastor, people to responsibility before God. We yield to what the Holy Spirit is doing and say, blow, spirit, blow. Take us where you want us to go. And we will go there because we don't trust our strength but yours. Blow, spirit, blow. And take us where you want to go. And may God be praised because of what the Spirit will do in this place. Heavenly Father, I praise you for faithful Christians who are seeking to do your work. How we praise you for a faithful pastor and wife who love you, love this church, and love the work of the gospel. I praise you for a presbytery and churches and individual leaders who have pressed us all into believing that you're still working and you are still calling us to be part of that great gospel mission. For the leaders who will be groomed and then leading in this place, would you grant them not confidence in themselves, but in your word and spirit, that they would lead this church by your path, which is your power, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Do this, we pray, for the glory of our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.